Like the office they commemorate, presidential libraries are living institutions. Certainly it is my hope that the Reagan Library will become a dynamic intellectual forum where scholars interpret the past and policymakers debate the future. Welcome to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute's virtual event series. To fulfill President Reagan's mission of making the Reagan Library a dynamic intellectual forum, our Center for Public Affairs Programming offers lectures and forums presenting perspectives on important public policy issues of the day. Each year, we bring you 20 to 30 events from politicians, authors, members of the media, business and military leaders, and more. Since the March 2020 closure of many businesses across our great country, the Reagan Foundation is now bringing its events online to ensure that we are still delivering world-class content, even if you can't get to our hilltop to watch it in person. In this week's Center for Public Affairs virtual event, we invite you to join us for a conversation with Fred Ryan. From 1982 to 1989, Mr. Ryan served on the White House staff and was assistant to the President of the United States, one of the youngest people ever to serve in such a position. His responsibilities in the White House included directing presidential appointments and scheduling, where he was responsible for long-range strategic planning and communication strategy for the White House. He also served on the 1984 President Reagan Bush re-election team. From 1989 until 1995, Mr. Ryan served as President Reagan's post-presidential chief of staff. He was responsible for overseeing all of President Reagan's activities, including domestic and international issues, government relations, political affairs, and public relations. He served as President Reagan's personal representative in numerous meetings with heads of state around the world, as well as leaders of the international business community. Fred Ryan joins us today to discuss his brand new book, entitled Wine in the White House, A History. The first book of its kind, Wine in the White House, is a comprehensive journey through the history of White House hospitality that explores every president's experience of wine. The fully illustrated pages also feature memorable presidential toasts, menus from historic White House gatherings, a catalog of vintages served, and spectacular new photography of the White House glassware collection. Although wine has been served through the history of the White House, modern presidents, regardless of whether they enjoyed wine themselves, have used the White House as a venue to showcase the fine wines produced in the United States. Fred Ryan currently serves as the chairman of the Board of Trustees for the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. In this position, he has sat on stage in conversation with many of our country's top politicians, acting as the interviewer. During today's conversation, we have turned the tables and now we interview him. This event will be enjoyed by all lovers of wine and or presidential history. We now invite you to enjoy our virtual program, coming to you from our Air Force One Pavilion Leadership Academy Oval Office with Fred Ryan and Reagan Foundation and Institute Executive Director, John Highbush. Fred Ryan, what a pleasure it is to have you with us at the Reagan Library today, albeit uh, virtually. It's just uh, wonderful to have you for a special occasion, and the special occasion, of course, is this magnificent book. Uh, Fred, congratulations. This is really an incredible piece of work. Well, thank you, John, and it's a great pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me. Um, Fred, the world knows you from a Reagan Foundation perspective as its chairman. You've been chairman for many years. But I don't know that a lot of our guests uh, know your political background, how you got your start in politics, how you uh, landed at the White House. Can you just give us some background on that? Sure. Uh, surprising to say, I, I first met Ronald Reagan when I was a student at USC. Mm -hmm. I had um, somehow managed to get a ticket to a reception that was taking place in Santa Monica, not far from USC. And it was a political event and Ronald Reagan was the guest of honor. And I was there, as I said, 20 something years old. Uh, I went in and I walked up and introduced myself to him. And here he was, he'd been the governor of California. He'd been a famous movie star, star of television shows. And he ended up being so welcoming and friendly that I ended up talking to him for probably, well, at least it felt like 45 minutes. And in the course of it, uh, I just thought he was such an engaging and approachable guy I, I finally said, you know, I understand you might run for president. And he said, well, I, I am thinking about it. And I said, well, if you do, I, I would love to volunteer on your campaign. And then two years later, he announced he was running for president. So I went down to the campaign headquarters and walked in and volunteered. And that began which 
between the campaign and then the honor of working for him in the White House. And then when he left office and now the honor of serving on his foundation, it's been almost 40 years of nonstop uh, service to President Reagan, which I could not have enjoyed more. Yeah. Now, you had to, at that age and then going to the campaign, you had to have been the youngest to ever staff assistant in the White House and eventually assistant to the president, right? Well, it, one thing that was surprising was Ronald Reagan, who at that time had been our oldest president, ended up having the youngest staff. The research was done, and you may have thought that President Kennedy would have had a young staff or another president. His staff was the youngest in modern presidential history. And I think a lot of it was this appeal to young people. He was kind of like on that fatherly or grandfatherly figure to many of us. Sure, sure. Uh, OK, so you get your start in politics in the White House. You work for the president. You get to know the Reagans well. Um, but all this time, you must have had your eye on wine, Fred, because this book, it, uh, you know, you can tell from the very beginning, almost your high school or college days, you got interested in wine. And so tell us about that, the growth in your ex of your expertise in that regard. Well, I went to college in California, like I think so many people who were young students or young people at that time, uh, we saw the California wine industry just taking off. And it was a chance to, to learn about how wine was made here in our own state. And uh, I actually got to visit Napa Valley when I was a student uh, at USC. We would go up to the away games at Stanford and Cal Berkeley. And while up in the area, we'd always try to drop by Napa Valley and learn a little bit more about it. So it's just been an interest that I've had for a long time. Well, uh, an interest passionate enough, strong enough that you must be involved with a winery, have a partnership in a winery, own a winery. I'm not sure which, but I know that I have um, had the, the, the distinction of drinking a Ryan wine, right? Well, I, I did get involved in a wine venture. I, I was just curious about how wine was made and thought it would be fun. And I found uh, a brilliant winemaker who had the last name Ryan. So uh, her name was Peggy Ryan. We weren't related, at least that we knew of. And that made the name of the, the wine easy. And she brought tremendous winemaking experience. And I guess I brought curiosity. Uh, and we would joke that she dealt with what was inside the bottle and I would deal with the outside of it. But it was really great. We did it for three years. And it was just a fun way to learn about how wine is made, the, the process of making it, the industry. Uh, how it's distributed, how it's such an important part of California and now uh, American um, production. Yeah, sure. Well, all that experience had to be beneficial when you went to write this book, I, I presume. Well, it, it was a really unique opportunity. I think if, if you get the chance to write about one subject that you're passionate about, that's terrific. But I get a chance to write about two subjects or actually the intersection of two subjects, wine and then presidential history. I'd also, while I was learning about wine. I was also a student studying political science and studying the, the White House and had the honor of eventually working there. So these two subjects that I had a, a lifelong interest in kind of collided for the, the writing of this book. Yeah, that's neat. Really neat. Um, OK, so has this has one of your three uh, vintages, have they have you ever had the opportunity to have a Ryan wine served at the White House? Because I'm sure that would really be something. Well, it was, it was a great honor when it was served at the Reagan Presidential Library. And then uh, at the end of the Obama administration, the White House Historical Association had uh, a dinner in honor of Michelle Obama, the first lady, and that's the associations always deal with the first lady. So it was kind of a, a farewell dinner. And I, I was so honored that the, the Ryan wine was served there as well. So it was really a culmination of a, of a joint venture to make wine. And, and I will say, uh, in all modesty, since I had very little to do with what was inside the bottle, it turned out really well. And yeah. oh, uh, it was, I think enjoyed when it was served. Oh, that's great. That's great. Um, Fred, I'd like, to sh I'd like to put up on the screen a number of photos and uh, to have you walk us through the book and also have some fun as well. Uh, and the first one I want to uh, put on the screen is actually the cover of the book. And I, I do so for a few reasons. Well, we wanted the cover to really reflect wine and the White House, the, the name of the book. 
So it's based on a state dinner, an actual state dinner that the Trumps gave uh, about a year ago, 2019, for the Prime Minister of Australia. And we did, we took a few liberties to enhance it. And that's all disclosed in the book. Uh, for example, you notice the wine glasses, they're all full. Typically wine glasses aren't all filled at the same time, but we wanted to give the full range of wines that are served at a state dinner. Sitting right in front of the president, you'll see a decanter. Well, at least in, in modern times, I don't think a decanter sits in front of the president of the United States, but that was a very historic decanter that belonged to our fourth president. And, uh, was, was part of the White House collection. So we wanted to have the decanter there. And then we took a few things, a few of their liberties just to kind of give the feel of the excitement of a real estate dinner and sitting in the president's chair. The, the book is designed to put you in the seat of the president and to see how presidents from George Washington to Donald Trump uh, serve wine at the White House and experiences they've had with it. Well, this had to be years in the making, Fred, right? I mean, it's hundreds and hundreds of pages of photography and stories. It, 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 have you been working on this for a decade or more? <laughs> Actually, it, it was about a two year project. Oh. Uh, and the goal was to make it as comprehensive as possible. There, there have been a number of books written about presidents, of course, a number of books about the White House, and then about art in the White House and music in the White House and furniture in the White House. But there never been a book about wine in the White House. So uh, once I got into this and I worked with a great team from the White House Historical Association, we decided to make it as comprehensive as possible and perhaps even to be the definitive book on wine and the president. So we try to cover it from every direction, from each president uh, and the wines they served, how America's taste in wines evolved, uh, how the wines are selected. People always wonder, how is the wine that's served at the White House actually chosen? And then where, what happens to it once it's chosen? How's it served? Where's it stored? We looked at uh, the glassware. You know, it's, it's really interesting to see over the years, going even back to George Washington, before the White House even existed, the presidents were ordering glassware and decanters. And these were becoming elaborate statements. I think as, as America was coming of age, we were having beautiful furniture in, our, in the White House and beautiful art. And the presidents wanted to have this beautiful glassware. So we. We have a lot of great photos of glassware going back to this over the centuries. And then uh, toasts, you know, toasts have become such a big part of presidential events that uh, we've got a lot of toasts and the history of toasting and some actual toasts that presidents have made. And then finally, uh, for those who want to recreate a dinner, if they want to take themselves back to a dinner that Jackie Kennedy had or Nancy Reagan had, the menus are there, the wines that were, that were served. And then finally, we thought once we got into this, let's just make it as comprehensive as possible. So there's a list of every wine that's been served by every president in the modern presidency going uh, back to uh, Truman and Eisenhower's time. So it's, uh, it's every lunch, every dinner, every state visit, it's all there. So we wanted to make it as exclusive as possible. And it, as you pointed out, it, it's, it's 450 pages long, <laughs> weighs five and a half pounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, amazing. Just amazing. It, it, it covers the waterfront, Fred. Um, now, on that cover um, that displays the White House, there's a decanter there, and there's a story behind that, that decanter, isn't there? That, yes, that decanter uh, belonged to our, our fourth president, James Madison. And um, it's been preserved since his time. And one very interesting thing that I learned in writing this book was as you know, the, the White House was built and John Adams was the first actual resident of the White House. And then in the War of 1812 that we had with England, uh, in actually in 1814, the White House was burned to the ground by the British. And a story is often told about how Dolly Madison saved that famous painting of George Washington, which is on the wall of the White House today. But I wanted to know what happened to the wine in the wine cellar. We knew that presidents <laughs> were accumulating wine. So I did some research and found that the White House did burn to the ground by the British. And then the British left and the American soldiers came over and found the wine in the wine cellar and they drank it all. <laughs> American history is just fantastic, isn't it? It really. Uh, okay, and what's unique about the book too, Fred, is that um, purchasers can actually buy a different covers um, uh, from the one we just saw. In fact, if you're a real fan of Ronald Reagan, uh, you can 
uh, buy it with President Reagan on the front, right? It, I, I can't imagine there's 45 different covers, are there? Are they, uh, how many different presidents are covered on the cover? Well, since the book covers every president and there are different institutions that uh, reflect the lives and the, the, the birthplace and the presidential libraries of the president, so we decided to make a number of, of custom options available featuring each president and their interaction with wine. And the one, of course, with Ronald Reagan was such a great photo. That I think that photo of him with the wine glass in his hand, it was at a state dinner, I believe, for the Prime Minister of Australia and just captured a great moment. I think that is one of the most commonly requested or frequently requested photos of President Reagan. And it just seemed so perfect to be on the special Reagan edition cover. That's right. Yeah, in fact, I know we've got that photo displayed in the Reagan's private quarters in their dining room. It was such a, a fitting place to have it. Um, this is a um, in your book, from, directly from the pages in your book, um, and it's a, a wine, uh, a bottle of uh, Chateau Mouton Rothschilds, 1955. And this bottle carries some particularly important significance to you, right? Tell us the story behind this one. Yes, it, it does. It, it's got a great deal of, of personal significance to me. I, I had the honor of working for President Reagan when he was in the White House. And then when he left Washington, worked in California in his office where he remained active doing the things that he wanted to, the, the job that he wanted to complete while he was president. And he had quite a wine cellar of his own. And on special occasions, he would pull out a wine, uh, either for a celebration or if it was a special occasion in someone's life, such as a birthday. And in this particular case, it was my birthday. And he pulled out a bottle of rare wine, as you said, Chateau Mouton Rothschild from 1955, my birth year, and <laughs> personally signed it and gave it to me. And it's just such a wonderful memory of him and a wonderful uh, item to, to, to have and be able for my family to have. Yeah, I, well, I, I have a feeling that bottle's not been opened, right? <laughs> <laughs> Waiting for the right occasion. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, now, Fred, you said something, and this, as long as I have uh, worked uh, for you and the Reagan Foundation, uh, I, I didn't realize this till I read your book, and that is that President Reagan had a lot of sophistication on the subject of wines. So, I mean, one of the, uh, more so than many other presidents, right? Well, there were several presidents who stood out as having particular interests in wine at different stages of our history, and Three in particular, I would mention. Um, one is President Nixon, actually. He grew up in, as a, a Quaker in a, a very simple life and became very sophisticated in wine. And he made sure in the White House that uh, very um, appropriate and uh, well-regarded wines were served at every event, spent a lot of time selecting them himself. Um, the first and foremost president, of course, is Thomas Jefferson, because he spent time in Europe, traveling the wine country, taking uh, meticulous notes on every wine that he tasted and then making recommendations to others and even ordered uh, wine for the White House. And even before he was president, he was advising George Washington on wine. He kept complete records of every wine that was served the entire time he was president and uh, even attempted to start wine growing in the United States in Virginia. Uh, in his, out, out in his country farm. But Ronald Reagan was also a very unique uh, president when he came to wine. As you know, he was governor of California at a time that the California wine industry was coming of age. Mm -hmm. The wine industry in California actually began in the, the mid 19th century, but it was considered essentially a novelty uh, early on, beginning of the 20th century, and then prohibition basically shut it down. But it came back in the 50s and in the 60s when he was governor, it was really um, arriving. And President Reagan had an appreciation of wine. He, he knew these California wines, but he also knew wines from around the world. Uh, but as governor, he did a lot to promote the and elevate California wine, served them, of course, in the state house. And then when he became president, he brought his devotion to California wines to the White House. And primarily California wines were served during the years that Ronald Reagan was president. Did he have a favorite wine, Fred, that he would serve often? I think he had a number of favorites, but there was one wine that, that kind of came of age. I think the, the winery opened while he was president. 
uh, or began distributing its wine while he was president. It was called Jordan. And if you look back at the menus and the wine served during the Reagan years, Jordan Cabernet Sauvignon, made in California, was one of the more frequently served wines. And, and I looked and I noticed he served it at events that you would probably consider special occasions. He served it, for example, when the Prime Minister of Canada was down for a state visit. And then the records show that the prime minister liked it so much, he called the winery and ordered a case of it. Mm -hmm. uh, President Reagan served it when he had the Supreme Court. Every couple of years, he'd have the Supreme Court in for a dinner at the White House. And he wanted to make sure those were wonderful evenings and he would serve it on those occasions. And also to a number of distinguished visitors. So that was one. I, I think he had a number of favorite wines, but that's one that he enjoyed sharing. Now, you cover in the book, Fred, um a particular wine that I guess was special to the president that he uh, broke open uh, for his uh, 33rd wedding anniversary, right? Tell us about that wine. Well, it, he would pick wines for special occasions and he would mark big events with um, special wine. And it was, as you said, his 33rd wedding anniversary. He and Nancy Reagan were in the White House. And I remember reading in his diary he said, it's my 33rd wedding anniversary, and we're having a bottle of 1911 Chateau Margaux. Now, Chateau Margaux is one of the, the greatest wines in the world. And as you know, John, 1911 was his birth year. So yeah. on his 33rd anniversary, he was having a bottle of wine that was made the year he was born. Yeah, amazing. Neat, neat. It's fun to enjoy wines. It really is. That's neat. a neat story. Um, Fred, I'm, uh, we'll put up the next uh, photo. And you'll certainly remember this from your book, What a Story This Is. Tell us about this famous bottle of wine. Well, as we were talking about earlier, Thomas Jefferson is regarded essentially as the, the founding father of, of American wine. And he had a deep passion about it. He traveled while he was emissary in France. He traveled throughout the wine regions. He, when he returned to the United States, he was still ordering wine. In fact, I found a letter, John, that was uh, amazing, that had, was written 240 years ago. It was sitting on the desk of the winemaker at a, at a very prominent winery in France called Chateau Yquim. And it was a letter from Thomas Jefferson to the owner of the chateau saying, uh, our new president, General Washington, has an interest in wine, and I think he would like to try yours. Please send him... 30 dozen bottles. And while you're at it, send me 10 dozen too. So Thomas Jefferson is kind of known as discovering French wines early in American history. Well, in uh, 1985, uh, a couple of bottles appeared on the market that were believed to have belonged to Thomas Jefferson. They were from Chateau Lafitte, which was one of the great wine uh, makers at that time. And uh, they're marked 1787 and TR engraved on the side of the bottle. These were found in Paris and they were immediately taken to the, the wine experts in, in, um, in London. And the wine experts said, these are authentic. The bottle seems right. The cork seems right. The engraving, it's got TR on it. So one of the bottles was put up for auction. And um, Kip Forbes, uh, son of Malcolm Forbes, uh, who's a very close friend of President Reagan's, of course, um, wanted that for a museum that they had in New York, the Forbes Museum. So he flew to London and the bidding began on this bottle of wine, single bottle of wine, went back and forth and ended up at $150,000, the most expensive bottle of wine ever sold. And Kip Forbes put it on the private plane, flew it back to New York and put it on display in the, the family museum. And two things happened after that. One was the curators didn't quite display it correctly. And the, the light that was on the bottle caused the cork to slip inside the bottle, ruin the contents, ruin the bottle. So that was the first problem. And the second one was that a couple more of these similar bottles came on the market and a collector bought them and was suspicious. So he hired a team of FBI, former FBI forensic agents to, to trace this down and to get him an answer about the authenticity of the bottles. And they determined in the process that the engraving where it said TJ on the side for Thomas Jefferson, it actually been done with an electric engraver, which didn't exist in 1787. <laughs> uh, and that the bottles were counterfeit. 
So all of this led Malcolm Forbes to conclude after his bottle spilled and it was a turn to be counterfeit, he said, I wish Thomas Jefferson had just drank the damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a story. What a story. I remember at the time, I think that was front page news when that happened. Yes. Yeah. And uh, this is proof positive that you didn't simply just cover the American presidents, but uh, lovers of wines and champagne from VIPs and famous people around the world, right? This is someone we all recognize, don't we? Yes. And, th and that... Um... The particular reference I, I have to Winston Churchill is when he visited the White House when FDR was president. And in going through the records, I found the notes of the White House steward on what was to be served uh, to Winston Churchill. And it was very interesting. Uh, it said, for breakfast, be sure he has uh, plenty of sherry. Uh, for lunch, make sure that there's scotch and soda. And for dinner, make sure that there's wine, champagne, and brandy afterwards. So all of these stories we hear about Winston Churchill and his consumption at least seem to be true when he was our guest at the White House in the United States. And, and one thing, John, in, in this book, I, I, we, one thing I tried to do besides making it comprehensive was to make it fun. And so there are little quotes and blurbs throughout the book that, about wine and about famous people and wine and presidents and wine. And I have to say, I, I love that one that you just showed on the page of Winston Churchill. He was talking about um, serving wine. And as you know, there, there are different size bottles of wine. There's the regular bottle and then there's the Magnum. That's a double bottle of wine. So the quote from Winston Churchill is, a Magnum of Claret is the right size for two gentlemen who are having lunch together, especially if one is not drinking. <laughs> yeah, I saw that blurb, Fred. I those things are just fantastic. They draw your eye right to some great stories. That, that was neat, yeah. Um, okay, this next photo. Um, here we are now, right, with a bit of Camelot. Uh, uh, the, the Kennedys uh, in the White House. Um, but Jackie Kennedy also uh, has a, a, is particularly important for another reason, which involves another association that you chair. Uh, tell us about that. And, and the importance of the Kennedys to the moment. Well, Jacqueline Kennedy uh, in 1961 uh, founded the White House Historical Association, and that's a, a nonprofit, non-political group that I'm involved in. And its purpose is to primarily to educate the public about the White House. And uh, and incidentally, the all of the funds from the sale of the book, 100%, will go to the educational activities of the White House Historical Association. Right. So there's been quite a, a, an association with uh, Mrs. Kennedy uh, and uh, the activities that the White House Association is involved in. Uh, but one thing I, I learned, a couple of things about the Kennedy administration. First, uh, as you know, uh, when it came to wine, as you know, everything that she focused on was French and elegant. And she, some of the menus of the food that was served in the White House were even written in French. Mm -hmm. So there was quite a, an emphasis on serving the finest French wines. And if you look back and wine experts will see that that no expense was spared in making sure that, that the guests at the White House, America's guests, state visitors, were served the most spectacular wines that the, in the world. And at that time, they were primarily French wines. So that was an interesting thing. But the other thing that really kind of got my interest was that, uh, you know, if you look at kind of wine consumption in the U.S., it, there was a slow period for a while. Uh, of course, Prohibition came around from 1920 to 1933, and that essentially eliminated wine production in the United States. And then there was World War II that stopped the import of wine. So there was wine was pretty limited, and America was kind of a, a cocktail nation, I guess you could say, in the, in the late 40s and 50s. And then in the early 60s, wine was coming, becoming part of a pop culture. And there was such a great example that I came across that I mentioned in the book. And that was James Bond, who was the icon of the era in the 1960s. And President Kennedy was a fan of him. He watched the movies and he read the books. Well, in May of 1963, Dr. No was released. James Bond film. You may remember, John, there was a scene in there where James Bond was about to defend himself uh, against a guard while he was being held by Dr. No. And he grabbed a bottle of champagne from the table and he picked it up and he was preparing to hit the guard with it. And Dr. No says, 
That's a Dom Perignon 55. It would be a pity to break it. <laughs> Back down to the table. Two months later, you look at the menu in the White House for a state visit. The champagne serve is a Dom Perignon 1955. And interestingly enough, the association with uh, President Kennedy and James Bond continued. And in fact, a special private showing of the newly released From Russia with Love was shown November 20th, 1963, two days before President Kennedy was assassinated. It was the last film he saw. Wow. Wow. What a story, really. Uh, I, I don't know uh, if there's a bottle left uh, of that wine, uh, Fred, um, today, but if there is, it must be worth a lot of money. I suspect it is. <laughs> Uh, the next photo, Fred, um, uh, this gets into the, um, the whole section of the book that you have, as you said, about toast and the importance of presidential toast. Uh, I, I bet you recognize the figure here. Yes, actually yeah. both of them. Well, toasting is a very interesting subject, and I, I've devoted a chapter on it because it's had quite a, an interesting history. Um, it's been going on since days of antiquity. In fact, in Rome, um, in ancient Rome, there would be huge banquets where each person would drink out of a huge vessel of wine and they would pass it to the next person and wish them good health as they passed it to them. And that was the beginning of kind of complimenting your guests. And at the same time, by the way, the, the wine then was not exactly of the standards that we're used to today. In fact, it could be pretty, pretty bitter and bad tasting. So they would drop a piece of toasted bread into this vessel and to absorb some of the impurities. And that oh. actually is where the word toast began. Oh. But toasting continued. And then it even got a little more grotesque than that. Uh, in Scotland, uh, during the 10th, 11th century, after battles, uh, the, the winning warriors would come back and they would drink from the skulls of the enemy that they killed. And when you hear people raise a glass and say skull, that's where it has its origins. But it evolved to be part of, of important events. After the American Revolution, at major state events, there would be 13 toasts in honor of each of the 13 colonies. But more recently, uh, toasting has had its own evolution. Uh, for a while, at state visits, uh, it, they started to become long foreign policy speeches. So. The rules evolved to make them the toast really a maximum of two or three minutes. And even then, it's gone bad a couple of times. There was, there was one when uh, President Carter was in Mexico City for a state visit, and President Lopez Portillo began the toast with a series of insults about the United States and attack on America's policy. And Carter responded, and it became known as the, the toast of insults. Uh, but And Carter also, by the way, had one lasting uh, impact on toasts that uh, all presidents follow to this day. And it, until President Carter, the toast was done at the end of the evening. And at a dinner, President Carter just kind of stood up before the wine actually had even been served. He had his water glass and he decided to go up and make the toast. He made the toast and then he realized that the wine hadn't even been served yet and that he was doing it out of sequence. So once the wine was served, he went back up and made the toast again. But for the rest of his presidency and Every president that's followed has done it at the beginning of the evening, frankly, just because they don't want to have the toast on their mind for the rest of the night. They want to enjoy themselves. <laughs> oh, what a story. So much history behind uh, American politics and its figures. Just amazing. Now, this is uh, a, a toast at 35,000 feet, right? And I bet you recognize this airplane because you played a very important role in its, in its history. Tell us about that. Well, President Reagan, uh, on many occasions, say on the return from a successful foreign trip, would have a bottle of champagne or sparkling wine brought out and the team would raise their glasses and toast the, the, the success of the mission. Uh, on occasion, if it was someone's birthday who was a, a senior member of his staff, he would have a, a cake brought out and champagne. And that became kind of a tradition on Air Force One which is you and I know and are so happy is now at the Reagan Presidential Library. And that happened because President Reagan flew that airplane more than any other president had. And it came out of service when he ordered a replacement. That's a Boeing 707. 
And as you know, the new Air Force One is a 747, which President Reagan ordered, but unfortunately did not get to fly on while he was president. Well, when the 707 came out of service, we thought the appropriate place for that would be the Reagan Presidential Library. And we came up with very detailed plans to build this enormous hangar that could display the aircraft. And we went to the, the Air Force Department and we went to uh, the Smithsonian. We went to the president himself, who was Bush 43 at the time, and asked for the plane. And uh, he very kindly agreed to let us have it. It was flown out to California, as you know. It was disassembled, reassembled inside the Air Force One Pavilion and sits there today for visitors to go through and see exactly what it was like to fly with the president on Air Force One. Yeah, just amazing. I'm about 100 feet away from that plane right now, Fred, and it still takes my breath away when you walk into that hangar that you were able to put together. It's just a fantastic piece of history here. Uh, this next photo, Fred, um, of, a, of a toast is also somewhat of a famous toast during the the Reagan years. I wonder if you'd tell us about this this woman. I think I'd recognize her, and um, and I think there's also a story about how President Reagan uh, thought it very important that he choose the wines uh, in relation to her visit and the and the uh, the dinners that occurred. Yes. Well, as you know, uh, an inordinate amount of time goes into planning state visits. Any state visit, they are planned weeks and months in advance, and hundreds of hours are spent around designing every aspect of a three hour state dinner in terms of the entertainment, the food, the guest list and the wines. And it's never uh, more elevated than when it's a royal visit, the Queen of England. And the Queen came to the United States uh, to President Reagan's home state of California. They, and he held a dinner in her honor, a state dinner in San Francisco. And he wanted to be sure and showcase some of California's great wine. So he spent time himself making the selections and uh, served her one of his favorite California wines. Yeah, I, it's interesting, Fred. Um, the, you're right. The fact that they call it a state dinner, yet it took place in San Francisco. Not all state dinners are necessarily at the White House, right? Right. Uh, they're typically, um, they can be any place in the country where the president hosts a, a visiting head of state. And they call it the state dinner because it's a, a two heads of state who are together. And then, as, um, as you know, when, when presidents travel, they will, and they're the guest of another state for a state visit, they'll often do a reciprocal dinner at the American embassy or the American ambassador's residence. And President Reagan made sure when he traveled that great American wines were also showcased at the reciprocal dinners that he had when he was, uh, when he was outside the United States. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay, we'll, I'll post this next photo, Fred. I bet you recognize uh, the fellow here. Uh, this photo is obviously from your book. And um, I was fascinated to see in relation to the story you told of this fellow that there is no wine cellar in the White House now. Is that right? Yes, the, uh, the wine cellar in the White House is, has evolved over the years. When, um, when Thomas Jefferson moved in, a third president after John Adams, there was no White House cellar. In fact, the White House wasn't even fully complete, but he decided that he would design the White House cellar. And we were able to find in his original papers designs that he used for a, a, an exact similar cellar uh, in Monticello. So he designed the cellar. And at that time, it was under the portico in front of the White House. And he'd gone to great detail to make sure that it was designed in a way that the temperature was, was steady, even, or wines could be stored and aged. And then when the, the British burned the White House in 1814 uh, and it was rebuilt, uh, a new cellar uh, was designed. And by the way, when uh, President Monroe oversaw the refurbishing of the, uh, the new White House, he was criticized for using congressionally appropriated funds to buy over 1,200 bottles of wine to, uh, to fully stock the White House wine cellar. But the, the wine cellar was, was maintained that location until the Truman renovation in 1948 to 52. As, as you know, President Truman actually moved out of the White House. The entire internal uh, design of the White House was, was redone, rebuilt to modern standards. And there was not much of a wine cellar left. So when I had the honor of working in the Reagan White House and had an interest in wine, I wanted to see the White House wine cellar. And I, I kept bugging the guy who was in charge, the, the chief usher, please show it to me. Finally, one 
uh, summer when President Reagan was away, he took me down to see it. And you can imagine the disappointment, expecting this giant wine cellar with arches and barrels and all. It's essentially a pantry. It's a small pantry off the kitchen that's been uh, fitted to have some racks to slide some individual bottles in. But uh, it's not the cellar that you would expect the White House to have. And, and, and partly it's because today the model has changed. And previously, presidents would buy wine for their successors to enjoy. And, and they would buy it and it would age and it'd be ready for the next president or the next president. But today it's basically done on an event by event basis. When there's a state visit coming up, they will think about the wine, they'll taste various wines, they'll decide, and then they'll purchase enough for that particular event and they'll store it there until it's served at the state dinner. Oh, okay. Well, there's the ultimate example of just in time um, <laughs> logistics, right, Fred? That, that just fascinating. Now, this next photo is what probably the, the average person thinks would be in the White House, but no, these are, these are two sellers that you know about. Tell us about them. Well, th that's what I was hoping to see when I finally got to uh, <laughs> get a peek at the White House wine cellar. But these two sellers are going to show you by comparison. One is the cellar of the Queen of England. It has 38,000 bottles, in it, some of the best wines in the world. And, and the other is the cellar of the Elysee Palace, uh, the, 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 the residence of the president of France which has over 18,000 bottles in it. So in terms of the wine cellar comparisons, we are, a, we are a very, very distant third, if even there. Yeah, yeah. Um, now you mentioned uh, earlier, Fred, uh, the growth of uh, the popularity, the sophistication of uh, California wines. And uh, this next uh, photograph um, is an important historical document in that regard. Tell us about that, this story. Yes, this, uh, this is, is the rankings of the outcome of what was called the Judgment of Paris. It was uh, an amazing statement of the, uh, the arrival of American wines. And what happened was uh, Stephen Spurrier, a young wine merchant who had a shop in Paris, decided to come and try California wines. This was in the 1970s. And by the way, I had the chance to talk with him for this book, and he provided an incredible amount of information. But what he decided to do was bring California wines to Paris. He tried some of the, the wines that were just arriving on the scene that he thought were spectacular at a time that the rest of the world just looked at California wines as kind of a, a novelty, looked down their nose at them. So he, he brought these California wines to Paris and then he invited the top experts on wine, chateau owners, uh, maitre d's, uh, heads of wine associations to come and taste these California wines. And that was the invitation, come and try California wine. Well, the day of the tasting, he decided to make one minor alteration that made it historical. He decided to serve French wines at the same time he was serving the California wines. And he decided to put them all in bags so they couldn't be recognized. So they were all tasted blind. So it was meant to be a casual afternoon of tasting California wines became this high powered comparison. And what happened as we found, is, and as the page you just showed reflected, the California wines won in a blind tasting. And the, the, the French were shocked that California could be making such great wines. So it was called the Judgment of Paris and probably more than any single event propelled California wines onto the world stage. Yeah, not an amazing story, really. Um, oh, to have been in that room on that day and to watch that, just amazing, yeah. Um, so we talked about toast spread, and I thought it might be kind of fun to uh, give you a pop quiz, as it were. The, a lot of, this next photo uh, that I'll show you is indeed from the book, uh, and you've spoken to it. It's just a classic. But um, I, I'd like to show you a series of other photos that we have from the collection here at the Reagan Library and just ask you to... Uh, uh, name the VIP, if I would. So, if you would. So, uh, if we go to the next photo. I, uh, I hope you're grading me on a curve on this. <laughs> uh, I bet you this one's not too hard to figure out. Uh, yes, Margaret Thatcher and, and President Reagan. Uh, and it looks like it was, it was taken on a reciprocal visit uh, uh, in London on a state trip. Okay, we'll go, uh, let's uh, pick up the next photo. This is four gentlemen, famous gentlemen, having fun together, toasting, Who and these are? 
This was a very historic moment. This was shortly after President Reagan was elected uh, to the office of president. Anwar Sadat, who had been uh, a great American ally in hoping to bring peace to the Middle East, was assassinated. And in order to show respect uh, to him, President Reagan asked all of the living presidents, there were three former presidents alive at the time, uh, uh, Nixon, Ford, uh, and uh, Carter. He invited them to the White House and then dispatched them to be the official delegation to the Anwar Sadat funeral. And while they were there, it's the first time four living presidents had ever been together. And that photo kind of captured them. Uh, I can't quite tell if they were toasting or drinking wine or coffee or maybe <laughs> a little bit of everything, but it's an incredibly historic photo. It sure is. Um... Okay, this next photo, this might be a little more difficult. It'd be de very difficult, I bet, for the average viewer who's watching today. But this is uh, President Reagan toasting someone on the White House staff, right? Yes, that's, uh, that's in the Roosevelt Room at the White House. And I can tell the, the gentleman on, on the left is somebody who was a longtime uh, and devoted aide to President Reagan, uh, Marty Anderson, uh, who was a, a, a domestic policy advisor to President Reagan and went on to write some incredible books uh, featuring President Reagan's own writings from his radio talks uh, and his speeches as he was running for president. That's right. Okay, this next photo, this one stumped me for a few seconds and then I figured it out. Um, but uh, we have uh, the president here with... It's the emperor of Japan, Hirohito. And it was... Um, I believe here at Hito, uh, and it was taken, I believe, on a, a visit to Japan uh, while President Reagan was in office. This next photo, I would, if this were Jeopardy, Fred, I would say this would be a, a daily double because I couldn't get this one until I had to look it up. But this, this is. It's the the uh, the president of Korea. Uh, I'm not sure which one, but uh, I believe that was taken uh, at with their equivalent of the White House, the Blue House, which is the official presidential residence in, uh, in South Korea. That's right. OK, I'll give you 50 points on that. That's the, <laughs> the President uh, Chung Doo Hwan. Ah, That's OK. The, yes, but you're right, the South Korean president. Uh, this next photo, um, I pulled this out because I know it has special <laughs> The cabinet member has a particular significance to you, Fred. This is during the Reagan administration. Give us the story behind this one. Well, again, this was taken in the Roosevelt Room. You can see the, the picture of FDR on the wall, as is uh, the, the painting of uh, Teddy Roosevelt. This is James Watt. He was Secretary of the Interior for President Reagan. He was a bit of a controversial character, but he got himself in a, in a bit of trouble with the President and First Lady when, on the 4th of July, uh, there was a tradition in Washington to have entertainment and popular American bands perform on the mall for free. And then there'd be a fireworks show that followed. And the Beach Boys had been invited to perform. And uh, Secretary Watt canceled, revoked the invitation, saying that he thought that a group like the Beach Boys would bring the wrong element. And a huge <laughs> controversy ensued. And he got invited over to the White House by President Reagan and was informed by President Reagan that he was a Beach Boys fan and he thought it was the right element. And the Beach Boys were reinvited to the White House, uh, to, uh, to, the, uh, to, to the mall, but also to come to the White House while they were there to see President and Mrs. Reagan, who'd known them and who'd been fans from their days in California. Yeah, well, I, if I recall correctly, you are a fan of the Beach Boys as well, right? I am a fan of the Beach Boys and uh, I was so pleased for President Reagan's centennial do you know that the Beach Boys performed at the Reagan Presidential Library in honor of him on what would have been his 100th birthday? That's right. What a lot of fun. Okay, this next photo, Fred, is uh, it's uh, a state dinner that if there were a state dinner that someone wanted to attend during the Reagan years, this was probably it, right? Yes, this is uh, Princess Diana, Princess of Wales, and Prince Charles were there for an official dinner. And it was one, as I said, when it's a royal visit, the, all the stops are rolled out. And this was one where Nancy Reagan had gone to incredible detail to plan it. She knew that uh, Princess Diana liked to dance, so she invited John Travolta, who mm -hmm. was the star of Saturday Night Fever, 
uh, noted dancer. And uh, there's actually a photograph of John Travolta and the Princess Diana dancing together at the White House. But it was probably one of the most unforgettable uh, state visit to the White House. And I think if you or I could go back in time and arrange an invitation, that's probably one that we'd want to be invited to. Yeah, you're right. Absolutely right, Fred. This next photo, um, I, I have included this one from our collection because it shows that President Reagan during his years was uh, not the only diplomat, in, as it were, to uh, give toast and uh, to really help shape foreign policy for the United States. This is uh, Mrs. Reagan with? This is Chancellor Helmut Kohl of Germany. And he was a, a key figure in the, the, uh, the effort to end the Cold War and then to reunify Germany. And as you know, Nancy Reagan was uh, uh, astonishingly in support of her husband in his efforts to end the Cold War and to limit the spread of, of nuclear weapons. And Helmut Kohl was uh, an important ally in that process. And it's very clear that in that, that lunch or that dinner, she is uh, showing her appreciation. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now this next photo, Fred, is probably one of the most famous photographs of, uh, of, of First Lady Nancy Reagan. Uh, certainly during the, the Reagan White House years. Uh, tell us about this one. Well, this, of course, is with General Secretary Gorbachev uh, of the, the Soviet Union, who um, became a, quite a, a close uh, friend, uh, and as well as somebody who worked very closely with President Reagan uh, to successfully, for the first time in history, reduce the number of nuclear weapons. As you know, Every treaty up until that time had actually put caps on how many more could be built. And in this true treaty, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Weapons Treaty, it actually reduced and eliminated an entire class of nuclear weapons. And it was something that took a lot of effort on both sides. Uh, but when it was done, President Reagan invited Gorbachev to Washington and had a special dinner in his honor. And there's Nancy Reagan raising a glass to celebrate with him. Yeah, a great, great photograph. This next one, uh, I'm not going to be unfair about it, Fred, and ask you to name every individual at the table because I don't think that's possible. But uh, I bet you would recognize, given the colors there, uh, what the occasion is with President Reagan in this toast. Well, yes, uh, it's St. Patrick's Day. And as you know, <laughs> President Reagan was proud of his Irish heritage. And he made a point uh, every year on St. Patrick's Day to have the prime minister uh, of Ireland come to the White House and also to go up to Capitol Hill and to uh, have a friendly lunch, raise a glass with the congressional leadership. And I, I think it started because Tip O'Neill, who was the Speaker of the House when Ronald Reagan was first elected, was a, a proud Irishman. So these two Irishmen would get together and tell Irish jokes and on St. Patrick's Day have a series of toasts. And it's a tradition that President Reagan continued throughout his presidency. Yeah, well, we, we don't see a whole lot of these uh, visits by the president to the Capitol Hill these days, do we? No, um, not at all. Um, okay, this next photo, I bet you you, you might recognize this famous couple. Uh, this is? I believe this is the wedding day of Ronald and Nancy Reagan. They uh, are, looks like they're exchanging their, their toasts. They were married out in... Um, I believe in Toluca Lake at uh, uh, prominent actor, Bill Holden uh, and his wife were the, uh, the, 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 the best man and maid of honor. And I believe that photo was taken that day. That's but I, don't right. know what, I don't know what he was serving. I'm sure he picked a very <laughs> special wine or special champagne for that. Yeah, I bet you're right. Um, Okay, I think it's only right to show this, uh, this next photo, uh, just in honor, because it's in honor of our current American president. This is, uh, uh, I think I recognize who that is. I don't, I don't know if you do, Fred, that uh, President Trump is toasting. Yes, this is the state visit that the, the Trumps uh, hosted for uh, the Prime Minister of Australia and his wife. It was really a spectacular event, and that photos of that are used for the cover of the book. It was something that uh, Melania Trump spent an extensive amount of time preparing for. It was a beautiful dinner in the Rose Garden, outdoors, and really an incredible uh, opportunity to showcase and to uh, American wine and food and, and, and hospitality. Yeah. This next photo, Fred, I think it might be our last, is uh, it's of a, of a bottle of wine. I, I bet that you recognize it. 
uh, we, we talked about uh, this label being served at the White House. What a, what a, a beautiful bottle. And, and it reminds me, I wanted to ask you, Fred, if you had to choose just one wine, uh, you know, you're on a desert island and that's it, you can have only one wine, uh, what would it be? Would it be a, 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 something from the, the Ryan years? Uh, what, what, what would it be? That, that's a tough question, John. I, I couldn't say for sure. There are so many great wines being made across the United States and around the world today. And certainly California uh, is making some fantastic wines. And one thing I learned through this little wine venture I was in and in writing this book is really uh, how, how much goes into making wine. You know, we're, we're all used to just pulling the cork out and pouring and saying, doesn't this taste good? But winemakers work hard. They, they have to they have to be lucky. They have to have great soil. They have to have great sun. They have to have a, they can't have a drought. They have to have a nice mild year. And then they have to decide when to, to harvest and harvesting too early or too late could have an impact on the wine. And then as we're seeing tragically right now, they're, they're at the mercy of nature and fires can destroy not just the vineyards that are burned themselves, which has been Napa Valley has been hit particularly hard this year, but the smoke can damage uh, grapes that are miles and miles away. So making wine is a, a, a very challenging endeavor. I admire the people who do it, and especially those who strive to make a wine that's worthy on being on the table of the president of the United States. That's right. Well, Fr Fred, we've come to the end of our time together, but before uh, we finish, I wanted to follow through on a, a promise we made to our viewers, uh, and that is uh, we were fortunate enough uh, a year or two ago to acquire uh, several cases of the Ryan uh, 2010 Chardonnay. And uh, two of our viewers that, are, that are, have watched us today um, are the lucky winners of a case each of this Ryan Chardonnay. And we're now going to put up on the screen uh, the names of those two winners. Well, congratulations to the winners. I hope they enjoy it. And I would just say it's a 2010 wine, so it's ready to drink. Don't wait too long. <laughs> Bring your friends and family over and enjoy it soon. Yeah. Fred, it's just been marvelous to be with you today to talk about this incredible book and to hear your history uh, in the world of wine and uh, to talk about the presidents and their involvement with wine, especially President Ronald Reagan and First Lady Nancy Reagan. Uh, thank you so much for a special hour, Fred, and, and uh, uh, we look forward to seeing you out here uh, uh, in, the, in the future to perhaps enjoy another bottle of uh, this Ryan Chardonnay. Well, thank you, John. It's a great pleasure, and I do look forward to the time when uh, life is back to normal again and we can raise a glass together and, uh, and toast our favorite president. You got it. Great to be with you, Fred. Thanks so much. Thank you, John. We hope this conversation has inspired you to share what you've learned with your family and friends and that you'll join us again for an upcoming event. And let me offer lesson number one about America. All great change in America begins at the dinner table. So tomorrow night in the kitchen, I hope the talking begins. And children, if your parents haven't been teaching you what it means to be an American, let them know and nail them on it. That would be a very American thing to do.